I'm delighted to be here. When I was asked to come and to speak on this conference, I really wasn't for sure what I should talk about until I got here. In the last few minutes after arriving, I'm beginning to get a feel as to, I think, what you are looking for, what you're seeking for, and hopefully I can add something to what you're looking for that might help you along the way as you seek your careers, seek out your careers, and look to the future as to what you really want to do in life. I think your theme today is a very good theme, and it is talking about vision for the future, and certainly all of us need a vision, for sure, without a vision there is nowhere for any of us to go, and I think even the Bible talks about the fact where there's no vision, people perish. So certain visions are important. So what I decided I would do today is to begin talking to you by telling you a story that I read from Richard Kemperow's book, Think, Grow, and Be Rich, maybe, where he tells a story about the acreage of diamonds. And you may have, may have heard this story before, but I want to begin my little talk today by telling you about that and say a few other things to you. Acreage of Diamonds, it was, of course, by a man named Russell H. Conwell, who was a lawyer, who later became a minister. And in his role as a minister, he developed this talk, which is a two, true story, about Acreage of Diamonds. In fact, he made several appearances across the country, and in his lectures, he earned over Actually, more than 8,000 times, he earned uh, about $8 million in lecture fees, who later on went on to uh, found Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to serve undeserving young men. Acreage of Diamonds was the true story of a poor farmer who settled in Africa and spent years struggling to raise his crop. His land was rocky and difficult to till. Disenfranchised with the circumstances, the farmer became increasingly fascinated by tales of easy wealth gained by men who had searched for and discovered diamonds in the countryside, and he too wanted to be rich. He grew tired of the endless labor and impulsively sold his farm to search for diamonds. For the rest of his life, he wondered the vast African continent searching for these gleaming gems. But the great discovery always eluded him. Finally, in a fit of despondency, broken financially, spiritually, and emotionally, he threw himself in the river and drowned himself. Meanwhile, a man who had bought his farm found a rather large and unusual stone in the stream that cut through the property. It turned out to be a diamond of enormous value. Stunned by his newfound wealth, the farmer discovered that his land was virtually covered with such stones. This became one of the world's richest diamond mines. Now the first farmer who unknowingly owned the acreage of diamonds sold the property for practically nothing in order to look for riches elsewhere. If only he had taken the time to study and realize what diamonds look like in their rough state and had first thoroughly explored the land he had owned himself, he would have found the riches he sought on the very land that he had been living on. What a profound story, and what affected Dr. Conwell so much about this story and thousands of others was the mere fact that most of us, and even those of us in this room, are perhaps standing in the middle of our acreage of diamonds right now, and we don't realize it. I tell you that story because it, it leads me to where and what I want to talk about today. First thing I want to point out about this farmer who sold his acreage of diamonds was he judged the present by the past. He looked around at himself perhaps and thought because he had not found the value of his land, he would never find it. I will tell you today that it's dangerous for you to judge your presence by your past. Just because things have been going well for you does not necessarily mean they won't go well tomorrow. 
I think the second mistake this man made was rather than seeing a possibility, he saw a problem. You know, life is kind of like that. You can get up in the morning and you can see a problem or you can see a possibility. I remember when I first had the desire to go into business. The first step became pretty easy because I had the money to start up my first business. But after a couple of years, a couple of maybe two and a half years in business, I wanted to expand to my business. And I needed about a half million dollars to do that. And even after a couple of years of being successful at what I was doing, and by the way, I'm in the broadcast business, as Allison told you, on a couple of radio stations back in West Tennessee. I put a business plan together and went to the bank to borrow a half million dollars with about $50,000 or less worth of collateral. First thing you would think, that's foolish. We got an attorney sitting at the table and he would tell you that's probably one of the most foolishest things you could ever do is to go to the bank to borrow money with not enough collateral. But I had a vision. I knew who I was. I knew what I wanted to do. I went to the bank and I said to the gentleman at the bank who happened to be the president of the bank, I said, I want to borrow some money to expand my business. And he said, well, come on in. Maybe we can help you. And we got talking. And when he found out that my collateral base was so low, he said to me, my board won't go for that. You can't borrow that kind of money with small, this small, a small amount of collateral. And I replied and said to him, I know your board won't go for it if you tell them. That's why I need an appointment with your board so I can sell this idea. Because you don't really know what I want to do. You don't have my vision. You don't know who I am and you have no earthly idea what I want to do. What I knew was I didn't have the collateral, but I had the vision. And if you've got the vision, the collateral of whatever it may be will fall in place. So this gentleman, kindly enough, gave me an opportunity to go before the bank board. I've never been before a bank board before in my whole life. I went in a room with a bunch of ugly old men looking like me. Thanked them for letting me come in after putting my best suit on. I only had a couple of suits. Had a briefcase with one sheet of paper in it. I wanted to impress them. I prayed on my way to the bank because I thought, now Lord, what am I going to say to these folks now that you have given me this great opportunity to speak to a bank board to ask them to, for money? Now, what are you going to say because you sure don't have the collateral? And sure enough, I thank God for being a saved person because the Spirit of God gave me the right words when I stood up and thanked them for letting me come before them and so forth and so on. And I said, well, I know y'all think I came in to borrow money today, but I really didn't. I came in to ask you to join in my vision and become my business partner. <laughs> and everybody looked around and said, what is he talking about? I said, well, you know, I realize we need money to do this, gentlemen, but I have a vision. And my vision is this, that there are several radio stations that come into this area, but none of them play gospel music. And I've done my homework. There are 507 churches in the area that my station is going to cover. And that is the market that we're going to touch and make money because no one else is touching that market. 